Hello everyone, my name is Damien and I work for Independent Living Movement Ireland. Many thanks to everyone for joining us today. We've just one or two people who are still coming in. Um, what I wanted to do just as we started, you, you'll have noticed that we have all microphones set to mute um, and there's a reason for that. We're going to record today's session so we want to try and limit as much background noise as possible. We'd also ask that people would turn their cameras off. It just makes it much easier for recording process um, to have cameras off as well. Um, when we get everyone into the room, I'll do a formal welcome and introductions. Uh, the agenda for today is that I'll do a very brief introduction about Independent Living Movement Ireland, or ILMI, and why we have organised this event today. And then I'm going to introduce you to uh, Joe Watson from A Disorder for Everyone, and then to Dr. James Davies. Um, and from there, Joe's going to give an input, and then D James is going to give an input, and we'll have a very brief Q&A with James after that. And the intention is we'll use the chat function for the, the questions and answers. The qu chat function is currently uh, deactivated, because it's very distracting for people uh, when a presentation is on for a, a large scale chat to be operational in the background. So we're going to, to deactivate the chat until we're getting to the questions and answer session and then we activate it then and we'll moderate that to give James an opportunity to, to give some feedback to people who have particular questions. So I think we more or less have everyone here. Um, so welcome. Uh, as I said, I'm Damien Walsh from Independent Living Movement Ireland. And for those of you who don't know, ILMI is a Disabled Persons Organisation, or DPO. Um, our values are ones of independence, choice and control. Uh, and our vision is an Ireland where disabled people have the freedom and choice to live life is, as equals in an inclusive Ireland. Our values are led by the social model of disability. And that piece is really important for today's discussion because it's why we've asked our colleagues from A Disorder for Everyone to join us here today. So the social model of disability uh, says that uh, people's impairments are not what disable them, but the structures uh, in society are what disable people. So where disabled people are uh, denied the opportunity to live their own lives or where they want to live or employment or education or societal or attitudinal barriers. Um, and what we wanted to do today as a cross impairment DPO is to begin to explore the social model of disability and how it relates to emotional distress. Um, and we were very excited to have linked in with a disorder for everyone because they share values of ours um, and we wanted to begin to explore that with them and what it might mean for ILMI as a cross impairment DPO. Um, what we wanted to do was to bring Joe in uh, to talk a little bit firstly about uh, a disorder for everyone and, and what, where they come from. And then after that, Dr. James Davies. So I'm going to formally introduce Joe. She's a psychotherapist, a trainer, a speaker and an activism activist. Her activism is motivated by a belief that emotional distress is caused by what is experienced and largely rooted in social factors. Uh, Joe founded the Facebook group Drop the Disorder in September 2016. She's part of the Mad in the UK team and editor of the PCCS books publications Drop the Disorder, Challenging the Culture of Psychiatric Diagnosis. And also We Are the Changemakers, poem supporting Drop the Disorder. Joe is the organiser of the Dro Disorder for Everyone events. Um, and you can find more about them. And we'll share these links later on, www.disorderforeveryone.com um, and can be found at, on the Twitter handle at Drop the Disorder. Uh, so thank you very much. I'll go to Joe in one second. We're also delighted to be joined by Dr. James Davies, who graduated from the University of Oxford in 2006 with a PhD in social and medical anthropology. He's now a reader in social anthropology and mental health at the University of Roehampton. He's also a psychotherapist and started working for the NHS in 2004. He is the co-founder of the Council for Evidence-Based Psychiatry, or CEP, which is secretariat to the All Party, Party Parliamentary Group for Prescribed Drug Dependence. He is author of the best-selling book, Cracked, uh, which was first written for a wider audience. And anyone who hasn't read it, I can't recommend it highly enough. And just before we came on there, they were delighted to say that James's new book, Sedated, will be released on the 3rd of June, uh, How Modern Capitalism Created Our Mental Health Crisis. Uh, he's published a number of academic books, um, uh, such as, uh, sorry, um, with University Press, Carnock Press, Palgrave Macmillan and Rutledge. And he's spoken about his research at the universities of Harvard, Yale, Oxford, Brown, UCL, Oslo, Columbia, New York, the New School in New York and CUNY in New York. He's written extensively for the media and his articles have appeared in The Times, The New Scientist, The Guardian, The Daily Mail, Harvard Divinity Bulletin, Therapy Today, Martin America and Sal Salon. He's spoken on BBC Radio 4, Sky News, BBC World News, BBC World Service, LBC, ITV's This Morning, News Tonight, and various national and local radio stations. 
He's also extensively consulted for the BBC, ITV and other media outlets. Um, and I'm delighted to have both of them join us here today. So, Joe, I'm going to hand over to you to give everyone a little bit of background on AD4E or disorder for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Damien. Great to be here. Um, thank you so much for the invite. It's really exciting to see more and more places opening up this discussion. So, yeah, we really appreciate being invited today. Um, Damien, you've asked me to um, talk a little bit about AD4E. That stands for a disorder for everyone. Um, so I'm going to try and do that as succinctly as possible. Um, AD4E is primarily an event and a website. And the name, a disorder for everyone, is like a kind of tongue-in-cheek criticism of a culture that labels and pathologizes emotional distress and normal human experiences. So much so that we probably all meet the criteria of at least one of the 300 plus so-called mental disorders that feature in the latest edition of the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. There really is a disorder for everyone. So it's kind of ironic, but also true. Um, <clears throat> so AD4E challenges the concept of psychiatric diagnosis and the whole um, medical model culture of patholo pathologizing distress on the grounds that there isn't a scientific basis for it. So we suggest that psychiatric diagnoses are not medical illnesses, they're human constructs. Um, in fact, they've been constructed around a table and a table of people with vested interests and DSM um, committees usually have representation from pharmaceutical industries. Now, if you've got any doubt about any of that that I've just said, my guess is that within the next hour, that doubt will have evaporated because James explains this with so much clarity, it kind of hurts. So I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that he's here speaking to you all today. So AD4E draws upon the work of people such as James um, and Lucy Johnston and Sammy Tamimi and Paula Kaplan and numerous other people that have been challenging the culture of diagnosis and disorder for many, many years. And just to make it clear, we're not saying that this distress, the distress that's typically associated with diagnostic categories doesn't exist because of course it does. Um, but we do, we do challenge the assumption that it can be best described and explained biologically. Um, UK psychiatrist Sammy Tamimi, who I've just mentioned, said Psych psychiatric diagnosis is subjective opinion masquerading as fact. There's no blood test. There's no black brain scan. Basically, it's my opinion against yours. That is juxtaposed with an endless amount of evidence that emotional distress is rooted in what's been experienced often connected with social factors such as inequality, poverty, racism, abuse, violence, oppression, discrimination. And yet, despite all of this knowledge, the medicalized way of explaining and understanding emotional distress is just all around us. It comes from all directions. We see it um, on TV programs about mental health, the so-called factual documentaries. It comes at us via soap operas and dramas and films. The vast majority of mental health or mainstream mental health organizations, definitely in the UK, are very much promoters of, of, of the biomedical model. Many of their websites um, list all of the disorders um, for our convenience so that we can find out about them. This is obviously a big problem because when people want to find out more about what they're experiencing, one of the first things we do is we go to the internet and we research. And the problem is if you're putting into a search engine what you might be feeling or experiencing, it won't, it won't take Google too long to offer you a disorder that fits the distress that you're describing. Um, I often encourage people to try this little experiment. So if you type in to Google, I feel low and withdrawn, it will give you very likely give you clinical depression. And if you type in, I have mood swings that are difficult to control, there's a high chance that you're gonna get bipolar disorder coming back at you. And if you put in, um, I sometimes lose time and feel disconnected, you're probably gonna get a whole um, load of dissociative disorders to choose from. So the point is, it's very difficult to access in information 
about any other ways of understanding hum, you know, emotional distress. It's all about what disorder it is. So, and then we surprised about the amount of young people who are identifying en masse with these labels of mental illness. So at the AD4E events, we talk about how surrounded we are by this medicalized narrative. And then we challenge the narrative in any way that we can. There's often a big focus on language and the importance of challenging medicalized language and the importance of reclaiming our own everyday language to talk about what we experience. Um, activist Jackie Dillon um, calls upon us to um, reclaim and reframe ordinary language that restores meaning and context and is firmly rooted in people's lived subjective experiences. And that's, that's really crucial because how can we even hope to create a socially informed, trauma informed, respectful culture if we're still using pathologizing language to describe people and their experiences? Another massive focus of the AD4E events is the theme of doing something. So it's kind of a call to action, really, because there's no point in holding events like a disorder for everyone where people connect with the damage that is being caused by pathologizing people's pain but they're not doing anything about it so the do something message is really a really key part of of what we're of what we're doing what we're talking about and what you know what we um, encourage um so big or small activism you know um, occasional tweeting signing a petition doesn't matter just doing something and a woman called Helen Margetts is a political um, scientist from Oxford, and she talks about how social media encourages what she calls tiny acts of participation, and that in, and it involves more and more people who would, otherwise wouldn't be involved. And this happens by um, social media encouraging people to engage in liking posts, tweets, signing online petitions, things like that. And um, the, the, this stuff on its own might sound like kind of insignificant small things, but she says that it can add up to large scale mobilization. And she says that, um, the that every tiny act of participation equates to a digital trace of resistance, which I really like the idea of that. So it's about seizing the opportunities to have the conversations, to make the points, to call out the language um, where we can. And I suppose for those of us who are working in whatever way with supporting people, then as part of that work, we need to be challenging all of this stuff. We need to be agents of change in some way because we witness the consequences of inequality and discrimination in society and all the stuff that is responsible for it, directly responsible for emotional distress. So surely we have a responsibility to play our part in informing the change. Um, so just to sum it all up, AD4E exists to challenge the culture of diagnosis and disorder. And as, as I said, we draw upon the amazing work that is out there. Um, and we also explore alternative non-pathologizing, socially informed ways of responding to emotional distress with a big focus on challenging medicalized language and the whole concept of doing, doing something. And we've just really been trying very hard to open up the debate wherever we can with the aim of getting as many groups, uh, many individuals, groups, organisations on board and encouraging them to be part of a, a wider movement. And just to share a little bit about how it, how it all kicked off, about five years ago, I was just a, a despairing therapist really, who'd had enough of seeing people diagnosed with these destructive labels. And I came to a point where I just couldn't witness um, the, the level of pathologizing anymore without shouting about it. And I knew I needed to do something. I didn't know what that was gonna look like, but, I, but at that time, around that time, I'd read um, Lucy Johnston's book, A Straight Talking Introduction to Psychiatric Diagnosis. And it gave me some hope and some validation, also some ideas. So I um, ended up talking to Lucy about the idea of piloting an, an event around the core messages um, of, of that book, just because I wanted people to, to hear them. Um, the main messages are people should have a choice about how they understand their own distress. They do not need to accept diagnostic explanations. There may be other ways of explaining the distress. And 
yeah, Lucy was up for doing an event. So we kicked off with the first A Disorder for Everyone event in Birmingham in October 2016. It went really well. So we did a second one in Bristol, a third one in Scotland, a fourth one in London. And then literally nothing apart from a global pandemic was going to stop us. And we toured um, the UK from Edinburgh to Cornwall to Cardiff, from Cardiff to Ipswich and completed 21 events um, before the world shut down in March 2020. And then at that point, we went online with regular poetry evenings, which I'll mention a little bit later. And then last September, we hosted a massive um, online festival that brought people together from, I think, about 18 countries um, with, yeah, from all over the world and um, a, a really great lineup of incredible speakers and a highlight from that festival was a presentation called the making of the DSM by one of my favorite people James Davis and James's work has always been a massive part of what's directly informed um, AD4E and we've been lucky enough to have him speak at several of our events and every time he's presented the feedback has been you know, ju just overwhelming. So before I pass over to him, um, I just wanted to share a piece of feedback. I'm not sure I ever actually shared with James um, from an AD4E event in Edinburgh that was a few years back now. An attendee wrote on one of our feedback forms, my whole understanding about what psychiatric diagnosis is has been detonated. I have been duped, the world is being duped, Thank you, James, for exposing this with such eloquence and clarity. I am changed. So that stuck out. I wanted to share that. So absolutely massive pleasure it is to introduce him today. So thank you. Over to you, James. Thank you so much, Jay. That was, it was lo lovely to hear that. Um, and I, I do remember the event in, in Edinburgh and you'd have, you invited me to come and talk to the group about DSM. And I, I just want to say that for me uh, that event was perhaps the most powerful and impactful conference that I have ever attended. I mean ever attended, it was remarkable. Um, there were poets, there were service users, there were clinicians, there were academics and everybody presenting and discussion were, were just passionate and, and thoughtful and creative and it was just it really was a wonderful uh, day. And I, I, I would say to those of you who have gathered, I have no stake in the game, I'm not an organiser of drop the disorder or anything like that, but I'm just, a, I'm just a huge supporter of Joe and Lucy and what they do. I would say if you get an opportunity to attend um, one of the drop disorder festivals uh, on Zoom, seize it, really seize it, because it's a, a really enriching and illuminating experience. And um, um so so i think there's one coming up in i think it's july uh joe is it july you've got another festival uh july the sorry i don't know the date 15th or... I'll, I'll, I'll get the dates later but yeah we've got something coming yeah. up in july and something coming up in september thanks for that shout out jane james really appreciate it yeah it's it's it, what you've done is 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 amazing and um and i think most people now in, in mental health have heard of you um, and what you're doing so it's keep going please do keep going so thank you thank you and thanks so much for uh, inviting me uh, today Damien I really appreciate and giving me this opportunity to share uh, some of my my work with you um, so why don't I get underway with doing that firstly I'm going to try and share my my screen hopefully um, you can now all see uh, my powerpoint Is that, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you all can. Uh, can somebody give me a thumbs up if that's okay? Just to make sure you can all see my PowerPoint. Yep, that works, James. Excellent, great. Okay, so um, I'm gonna to talk today about uh, the DSM. Um, and firstly, I'm going to kick us off with referring to a book I wrote, uh, which was actually published in 2013. Uh, many years ago now, it feels, um, called Cracked, Why Psychiatry is Doing More Harm and Good. And as you can probably tell from the title, um, at the time that book uh, was advancing a position that uh, was both countercultural and counterintuitive. And probably the approach today is, is very much the same. 
Um, and the approach and the argument went like this, that um, psychiatry over the last uh, 40 years under the uh, dominance of the uh, biomedical model has started to become bad for our mental health. Now, there are a number of reasons why I argue this to be the case. Um, here are uh, two before I focus on one in particular during this presentation. The first argument is that psychiatric drugs do not do what they say they do on the tin. They're more ineffectual and dangerous than many of us have been led to suppose over the last 30 years. The second point is that the links between the pharmaceutical industry and psychiatry have become far too enmeshed in recent decades. And this has biased psychiatry towards privileging psychopharmaceutical treatments in the management of emotional distress. And finally, at number three, and this is the point I'll focus on today, psychiatry has wrongly medicalized more and more people in contemporary society. So apparently one in four of us now suffers from a mental health disorder in any given year. And I'm gonna argue that this figure is so startlingly high because psychiatry has simply renamed more and more of our natural and normal, albeit painful human experiences as indicating psychiatric conditions that oftentimes require some kind of uh, psychopharmaceutical intervention. So in effect, by reclassifying painful normality as psychiatric abnormality, we have created the illusion of a psychiatric epidemic. Now, I'm not suggesting here, and to echo something that Joe said a moment ago, I'm not suggesting here that the suffering itself is illusory. No, the suffering is real. It demands our care and our attention and our val validation. What I'm suggesting is problematic is our tendency to recast this suffering in psychiatric terms. So what's at the heart of this illusion? Well, I'm gonna argue what sits at the heart of it is a book called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the book that includes all of the mental disorders that psychiatry believes to exist. Now, there are many interesting things about this book, um, but one that's always struck me is that this book has expanded at a faster rate than almost any other medical manual in history. So for example, in the 1970s, it included around 100 disorders, whereas today it includes around 370. So what is going on? Well, that's the uh, question I set out to answer when I started uh, researching the book. But I encountered an immediate problem, and it was this, that there was very little documentary evidence I could find that charted the processes that the committees who wrote DSM followed when they put that manual together. So I soon realized if I were to write a kind of reconstruction of events, then I would have to go and speak to the people who actually wrote DSM. And that's what I did. So I started with somebody called uh, Dr. Robert Spitzer, who's now generally regarded to be the most influential psychiatrist of the 20th century because he was chairperson of DSM-3. He headed a team of around nine people who wrote and put that manual together. Now, the reason I'm gonna start with DSM-3, which was published in 1980, was because by far, this was the most important edition in the whole manual's history. So for example, it established the modern diagnostic system under which we still operate today. It introduced 80 brand new mental disorders, many of the household name disorders, which you could be familiar with, things like post-traumatic stress disorder, attention deficit disorder, uh, major depression, mixed anxiety, depression, et cetera, and so forth. And finally, it significantly lowered the bar for what constitutes having one of these disorders. So what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna to present to you the interview data I gathered from speaking to the architects of DSM, and secondly, the archival data I gathered 
uh, from two separate visits to the American Psychiatric Association, where they house the DSM archive materials. Uh, but before I get to presenting you with some of that data, let me just uh, first set the scene. So I'm talking to you today from my university uh, in, in, in uh, London called Rehampton. And it was many years ago, I'm in my office just up the stairs up there. And I decide just off the cuff to see if I could reach out to somebody called Robert Spitzer who, who created DSM. So I looked online, I found a number, which I thought was the number of his office. So I called, I called this telephone number. Uh, a lady picks up the phone and says, says hi, hi. And I said, oh, hello, I'm, I'm calling because I'd like to see if it's possible for me to arrange an interview with Dr. Robert Spitzer. Uh, and before I could say anything more, I just suddenly heard her say, Robert, Robert. Um, and I heard in the background someone shout, what? And, uh, and she said, there's someone here to talk to you. And, uh, and before I knew it, Robert Spitzer was on the other end of the line saying, hello. And uh, I said, I told him who I was and said I, would want to, I wanted to interview him. And we ended up having a conversation for about an hour. At the end of that conversation, I said to him, look, this has been fascinating. If I come to the US, would you carry on this interview with me? And he said he would. So I got some money from the university. Uh, I flew over to the United States and six months later, I'm in a taxi uh, and I'm pulling up outside of his home in um, the, the, the historic leafy suburbs just northeast of Princeton University, which is where he's now living. My taxi pulls up outside. I, I walk up to the, to the door, knock on the door. Spitzer opens the door. He's dressed in, in uh, shorts, a loose sports top and sandals. And one of the first things he says to me is, uh, ah, do you wanna stay for lunch? Uh, I just finished one of those mountainous American breakfasts. So I, I struggled to, to say, yeah, that would be fine. Uh, but then to my relief, he said, look, well, before we sit down, uh, before we eat, why don't, why don't we sit down so I can, I can tell you what you wanna know? So we go in his, his, his front room and we sit down and I set up my computer and our interview begins. So one of the first questions I have uh, for Spitzer is the following. What was the rationale for the huge expansion of DSM? Remember, he introduced 80 new mental disorders. What was the rationale for that huge expansion that happened under your watch? And this is how he responded. The disorders we included weren't really new to the field. They were mainly diagnoses that clinicians used in practice, but which weren't recognized by the DSM. So by including them in the DSM, we gave them professional recognition. So presumably these disorders have been discovered in a biological sense. That's why they were included, right? No, no, no. There are only a handful of mental disorders in the DSM known to have a clear biological cause. These are known as the organic disorders. These are few and far between. So let me get this clear. There are no discovered biological causes for many of the remaining mental disorders in the DSM, the remaining being about 95%. It's not for many, it's for any. No biological markers have been identified. Now, let me tell you why this may sound strange to many people. It may sound strange because most people expect psychiatry to work much like the rest of modern mainstream medicine. So in modern med medicine, um, a name will only be ratified as indicating a disorder after some kind of pathological roots have been discovered in the body, in the cells, in the tissue, in the organs, etc. But the surprising thing about psychiatry is that it works in completely the opposite way. Psychiatry first names a disorder before any pathological roots have been discovered in the body. So in effect, a new mental disorder can go into the DSM and become part of our wider culture, even though there is no biological evidence to support its inclusion. So I continued. So if there are no known biological causes, on, on what grounds do mental disorders make it into the DSM? What other evidence supports their inclusion? Well, psychiatry has to look for other things, behavioral, psychological, we have other procedures. I asked him what these procedures were. 
I guess our general principle was that if a large enough number of clinicians felt that a diagnostic concept was important in their work, then we were likely to add it as a new category. That was essentially it. It became a question of how much consensus there was to recognize and include a particular disorder. So it was agreement that determined what went into the DSM. That was essentially how it went. Right. Another important point I just want to make here, um, agreement does not constitute scientific proof. So for example, if a, a group of theologians all come together and agree that God exists, this doesn't prove that God exists. All it proves is that this group of theologians believe it does. So in what sense is psychiatric committee agreement different? Why, when a committee of psychiatrists comes together and agrees upon something, should the rest of us accept they have got it right? Well, the obvious answer to that is, well, surely there were forms of research that were guiding the committees in the kind of agreements they reached. And if you're to make that point, that's a fair one. So let me deal with it now. I'm going to deal with it by drawing into the conversation someone called Professor Paula J. Kaplan, who's Professor of Psychology at Harvard Kennedy School. Now, Paula is very interesting and important in the history of DSM, in particular because she lobbied uh, Robert Spitzer and his team not to include a new disorder that was proposed for inclusion, and that disorder was called Self-Defeating Personality Disorder, or SDPD for short. Now, she argued that this was a very dangerous diagnosis to include because the symptoms of SDPD look very, very similar to the experiences women had if they'd been female, if they'd been victims of violence. So she was worried that female victims of violence could end up being pathologized by this particular diagnosis, number one, but also because this diagnosis could potentially let the perpetrators of such violence off the hook because they had a self-defeating personality disorder, the women, and therefore these men were just doing what these women wanted, okay? So for these reasons, Paula lobbied them not to include this new diagnosis, but Spitz's team remained adamant they wanted to include it. Now, when I was in the archives on my first visit, um, and by the way, there are about nine feet, lineal feet of documents pertaining to DSM-3. And one morning I'm going through one of the, one of the uh, boxes and I find a little file, thin file with a, with a tag saying SDPD on the top. So I thought, oh great, and I whipped that, whipped that out and I opened it up. And lo and behold, in there on the first page was the minuted meeting where the task force discusses Paula Kaplan's um, uh, criticism. And I'm going to read to you verbatim what the team was saying, because it gives you a sort of sense of where they're thinking is. Robert Spitzer. They, the women, present a narrow gauge but persuasive argument. Their powerful argument is that it is a political hot potato, the issue. The feminist issue is a false issue, that the diagnosis could pathologize female victims of violence. Think. Women's arguments seem irrelevant to the questions on the table. They are obscuring their own good arguments. The good arguments being that SDPD is a controversial diagnosis. The irrelevant arguments being those posed by Kaplan. Benedek, no empirical basis for category, but you're right, arguments aren't responsive to questions. Rose, we do great disservice by backing off and not acknowledging that this pattern is pathological. So as you can tell from the conversation, they're gonna keep SDPD in. So in a last ditch attempt to influence the committee, Paula Kaplan decides on a new strategy. I decided to scrutinize thoroughly the very research used to justify including SDPD in the DSM. Now let's have a look at what she found. Firstly, she only found two pieces of research which is a remarkably small amount by anyone's standard. But now let's have a little look at what that research constitutes. Firstly, in the first piece, Robert Spitzer gathered a group of psychiatrists who worked at the same university, all of whom already accepted that SDPD existed. 
He then showed them some old clinical case studies. All of the psychiatrists then unanimously agreed that the patients in these case studies had SDPD. Kaplan pointed out that just because some psychiatrists at one hospital all diagnosed their patients with SDPD wasn't proof that the disorder actually exists. All it proves, as Kaplan said, is that a group of psychiatrists working at the same institution gave the same label, rightly or wrongly, to a given set of behaviours. It proves nothing more than that. But if you think that first piece of research is weak, then just consider the second piece. A questionnaire was sent to a selected number of members of the American Psychiatric Association. This asked them whether the diagnosis SDPD should be included in the DSM. An official report later conducted by the psychologists Cutchins and Kirk showed that only 11% voted yes, which is surely not a representative sample of the psychiatric community. Now you could say to me, well look James, yes I see this is hugely problematic, but surely you're cherry picking an extreme example here to make a point, to try and rubbish the entire process. Surely the research basis for the inclusion of the other disorders was far, far more robust. And if you were to make that point, you'd be making a very sensible one. So again, let me deal with it now. And I wanna deal with it by bringing into the conversation someone called Theodore Millen, another key member of Robert Spitzer's task force. In what follows, he's talking about not SDPD, but the research basis for all of the disorders that DSM-3 included. There was very little systematic research, and much of the research that existed was really a hodgepodge, scattered, inconsistent, and ambiguous. I think the majority of us recognize that the amount of good, solid science upon which we were making our decisions was pretty modest. So let's go back to my sitting in the house of Robert Spitzer at Princeton University. I decided to read to Spitzer this quote to see what he made of it. And after a short and somewhat uncomfortable silence, Spitzer responded in a way I hadn't expected. Well, it is true that for many of the disorders that were added, there wasn't a tremendous amount of research, and certainly there wasn't research on the particular way that we define the disorders. In the case of Millen's quote, I think he's mainly referring to the personality disorders, but again, it is certainly true that the amount of research validating data on most psychiatric disorders is very limited indeed. So you're saying that there was little research not only supporting your inclusion of new disorders, but also supporting how these disorders should be defined. There are very few disorders whose definition was a result of specific research data. Now, I was so surprised by Spitzer's admission that when I returned from the US to my, to my office back in London, uh, I decided that I had to check it out with other members of his task force. So the first person I uh, approached was someone called Professor Donald Klein. Now Donald Klein is a really important figure in the history of DSM because unofficially he was second in command to Robert Spitzer. So a very influential figure in the creation of DSM. So I called him, I read to him what Spitzer has said to me to check whether or not he agreed. Maybe he disagreed. I wanted to find out, so I called him and I put, I read to him what Spitzer has said, and this is how he responded. Sure, we had very little in the way of data, so we were forced to rely on clinical consensus, which admittedly is a very poor way to do things, but it was better than anything else we had. So without data to guide you, how was this consensus reached? And I asked him for an example. We thrashed it out, basically. We had a three-hour argument. There would be about 12 people sitting down at a table. Usually there was a chairperson and there was somebody taking notes. And at the end of each meeting, there would be a distribution of events. And at the next meeting, some would agree with the inclusion and others would continue arguing. If people were still divided, the matter would be eventually decided by a vote. A vote? Really? 
Sure, that is how it went. So I'm now really intrigued with this voting method that they're voting in disorders. So the next person I spoke to was Henry Pinsker, again, another member of that key task force, the original nine. And I put to him that the, the issue of voting, maybe he had a different recollection, maybe he saw things differently. I put it to him, this is how he responded. Some things were discussed over a number of different meetings, which would sometimes be followed by an exchange and memoranda about it. And then, then there would simply be a vote. People would raise hands. There weren't that many people. Regarding the legitimacy of this method, Pinsker continued, we never had any question that that was how we should proceed. I had no reservations at all about working that way. And by the way, when, when I was in the archives, I managed to source 12 minuted meetings with the archivist of the task force, because uh, that's all we could find. And in 10 out of those 12 meetings, there was evidence of votes taking place. And I'm not just talking about one vote or two votes, I'm talking about loads of votes. In one, in one um, meeting, there were 24 votes on a whole host of different issues from how do we define the disorder to where do we set the, the threshold for getting the disorder to uh, whether or not to include the disorder, et cetera, and so forth. In other words, the archival uh, evidence absolutely supports what we're hearing from the people who were in the room creating the manual. The final thing I want to say about this um, uh, is also uh, voting isn't a scientific activity. But voting is a, is a cultural activity. When anything is voted into existence, whether it's a new political party, a new relationship with the EU, uh, a new mental disorder, the likelihood we've got it wrong is never far away. So, let me carry on. I want to I also now, I want to bring someone else in. She's very interesting. So the next person called Renée Garfinkel, she just finished a degree in psychology and she was looking for some work experience. She, she answered an advert at the APA. She turns up there on the first day. What can I do? And they say, oh, well, there's a conference upstairs on the seventh floor. Could you just go up there? They need someone to make coffee and maybe do some photocopying. So she goes up and it, it, it so happens to be the conference around the creation of DSM-3. It's the task force meetings creating DSM. So she quickly realizes she's actually privy to something very important that is going on. And I thought it important to interview her because effectively she was a real life fly on the wall, wall during the processes. So I wanted to hear from her, what was this process like? Uh, this is what she had to say. You must understand what I saw happening on these committees wasn't scientific. It more resembled a group of friends trying to decide where they want to go for dinner. One person says, I feel like Chinese food. Another person says, no, 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 I'm, I'm really more in the mood for Indian food. And finally, after some discussion and collaborative give and take, they all decide to go have Italian. She then gave me an example of how far down the scale of intellectual respectability she felt these meetings could sometimes fall. On one occasion, I was sitting in on a task force meeting and there was a discussion about whether a particular behavior should be classed as a symptom of a particular disorder. As the conversation went on, to my great astonishment, one task force member suddenly piped up. Oh, no, 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 we can't include that behavior as a symptom because I do that. And so it was decided that that behavior wouldn't be included because presumably if someone on the task force does it, it must be perfectly normal. So let me give you um, just some other impressions as to how these meetings would, would work, uh, taken from my own interviews and other sources. Um, so according to other members of these task force meetings that were often haphazard affairs, suddenly these things would happen and there didn't seem to be much basis for it except that someone just decided all of a sudden to run with it, said one participant. It seemed, another member admitted, that the loudest voices usually won out. With no extensive data one could turn to, the outcome of task force decisions often depended on who in the room had the strongest personality. But the problem with relying on consensus, reiterated Garfinkel, is that in the discussion, some voices will just get quieter. 
either because they don't want to fight or because they see they're in the minority and snap, that's when the decision is made. Admittedly, when the task force lacked expertise on a particular disorder, Spitzer would consult the relevant leaders in the field. And by the way, the archives are full of these consultations, letters being written back and forth between Spitzer and people he'd identified he could have an exchange with. And sometimes if he liked them, he'd invite them in for a meeting. But this um, also led to chaotic meetings uh, that members often found diff difficult to participate in. One of the only British members on the task force, a psychiatrist called David Schaffer, recalled how such meetings often unfolded. In these meetings of the so-called experts or advisors, people would be standing and sitting and moving around. People would talk on top of each other, but Bob, Robert Spitzer, would be too busy typing notes to chair the meeting in an orderly way. Now, in 2005, there was a very interesting article that was published in the New Yorker magazine, uh, written by a journalist called Alex Spiegel. And the article was uh, titled, A Dictionary of Disorder. And it was a biographical account of Robert Spitzer's influence on global psychiatry. Now, midway through that article, there's a very interesting section on the construction of DSM-3. And I just want to read you a, a, a paragraph from that now, because it's very relevant to what we are looking at here. Roger Peel and Paul Asada, psychiatrists at Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, DC, wrote a paper in which they used the term hysterical psychosis to describe the behavior of two kinds of patients they had observed. Spitzer read the paper and asked Peel and Lusada if he could come to Washington to meet them. During a 40 minute conversation, the three decided that hysterical psychoses should really be divided into two disorders, brief reactive psychosis and factitious disorder. Then Bob asked for a typewriter, Peel says. To Peel's surprise, Spitzer drafted the definitions on the spot. He banged out criteria sets for factitious disorder and brief reactive psychosis, and it struck me that this was a productive fellow. He comes in to talk about an issue and walks away with diagnostic criteria for two different mental disorders. And by the way, both of those disorders go into the DSM with only very minor modifications from the original criteria written up in that room with Spitzer. So let me uh, carry on um, by just summarizing this section quickly before moving on. So as soon as Spitzer's DSM-3 uh, was published in 1980, it became a sensation overnight. The almost 500 page long manual sold out immediately. The publisher of the DSM, the American Psychiatric Association, was taken completely off guard. It took about six months to catch up with all the orders that came flooding in. The new manual was not only purchased by psychiatrists, but by social workers, psychologists, psychotherapists, lawyers, educationalists, etc., and so forth. And the enthusiasm quickly spread far beyond the United States. By the end of the 1980s, most British psychiatrists were now being trained to use the DSM. Also, the categories that were included in DSM-3 became the categories that were studied by researchers internationally. So the disorders that were studied were by researchers in Germany, in the UK, in the US, in Canada, in Australia, in India, and so on and so forth, were those defined and listed in Spitzer's DSM. And yet, as the influence of the manual spread, the truth about its construction remained obscure. Most people using the manual simply did not know, and I would still say simply do not know today, the extent to which solid research or solid biological evidence support the, the decisions the task force made. They didn't know that the definitions of the disorders contrived the validity of the disorders included weren't decided on the basis of solid research, but were the outcome of committee decisions, which at best reflected the well-meaning uh, professional opinions of a very small group of psychiatrists, nine psychiatrists. <laughs> 
And so that was the final question I put to Robert Spitzer. Our team was certainly not typical of the psychiatric community, said Spitzer. And that was one of the major arguments against DSM-3. It allowed a small group with a particular viewpoint to take over psychiatry and change it in a fundamental way. What do you make of that criticism? What do I make of that charge? Well, it was absolutely true. It was a revolution, that's what it was. We took over because we had the power. Okay, so I've got about 10 more minutes left. I um, hope you're still with me. Just 10 more minutes, I promise I won't go longer than that. Uh, and I wanna spend those uh, looking at what happens next because in 1994, DSM-3 reaches the end of its shelf life and is replaced by DSM-4, which remains the DSM in use right up until 2013 uh, for 20 years until it's replaced by DSM-5. Now, I interviewed the chairperson of DSM-4 on a couple of occasions, and I just want to read to you uh, some of our exchanges. So the, one of the first questions I had for the new chair, which was Dr. Alan Francis, was with the benefit of hindsight, when you created DSM-4 20 years ago, is there anything you now look back on with regret? Is there anything you would have done differently? And this is how he responded. Well, the first thing I have to say about that is that DSM-4 was a remarkably unambitious and modest effort to stabilize psychiatric diagnosis and not create new problems. This meant keeping the introduction of new disorders to an absolute minimum. So what does he mean by that? He means his team only introduced eight new disorders into the main manual, which is a modest amount compared to the 80 disorders introduced by Spitzer. However, from another standpoint, this claim to modesty is very shaky because it doesn't take account of the 30 new disorders which were put into the appendix and the fact that his team subdivided many existing conditions, creating in effect new ones. So if you account the appendix inclusions and the subdivisions, all of which patients can and are diagnosed with, then Francis's team actually expanded DSM from around 270 disorders to around 370 disorders, the very opposite of conservatism. So we carried on. Yet despite that conservatism, and I let the comment slip, we learned some pretty tough lessons. We learned overall that even if you make minimal changes to the DSM, the way the world uses the manual is not always the way you intended it to be used. For instance, we added bipolar two, which is a uh, a milder form of bipolar. We added Asperger's disorder, which is a milder form of, of autism. And finally, we added ADHD. And well, these decisions helped promote three false epidemics in psychiatry. I asked him what he meant by that. Well, we now have a rate of autism that is 20 times what it was 15 years ago. By adding bipolar two, we doubled the uh, ratio of bi bipolar versus unipolar depression, resulting in lots more use of antipsychotic and mood stabilizer drugs. Rates of ADHD also tripled, partly because new drug treatments were released that were aggressively marketed. So every decision you make has a trade-off. You can't assume the way you write the DSM will be the way it'll be used. By the way, he's locating the cause of the problem in how people are using the DSM, not only how it was written. I would locate the, the cause of the problem in both. Uh, but anyway, he wrote it. So you can see why he's, he's using the latter argument. So I respond. So the way the DSM is being used has led to the medicalization of a number of people who don't warrant their diagnoses. Exactly. Can you put a figure on how many people have been wrongly medicalized? There's no right answer to who should be diagnosed. There is no gold standard for psychiatric diagnosis. What he means is there's no objective test to verify any psychiatric diagnosis. No blood test, saliva sample, urine sample that can be taken to verify the diagnosis you've given. So it's impossible to know for sure, but when the diagnosis rates triple over the course of 15 years, 
My assumption is that medicalization is going on. But could the situation be worse than what Francis is telling us? Because Francis is only referring to the eight new disorders he put into the manual. He's not referring to the appendix inclusions or the subdivisions, but also, and most importantly, he's not referring to the existing problem of over-medicalization that he allowed to live on from DSM-3 through DSM-4 and subsequently is carried on through DSM-5. Let me give you an example of some of the disorders he allowed to live on. We have things like female orgasmic disorder, caffeine-related disorders, stammering, stuttering, oppositional defiant disorder, which is something uh, I acutely suffer from, I think. And transsexualism. Now, I could continue, but look, nobody's suggesting that these things aren't experienced as problems by certain people, perhaps they are. But whether or not they constitute psychiatric illnesses is another matter entirely. So my final question to Francis, and I'm coming to the end now, my final question for Francis was, Given what happened under DSM-3, given it, was, it wasn't a scientific project, given that many of these diagnoses were frankly eccentric, why didn't you just not incorporate them into DSM-4, do away with DSM-3 and start again? And this is what he, how he responded. If we were going to either add new diagnoses or eliminate existing ones, there had to be substantial scientific evidence to support that decision, and there simply wasn't. So by following our own conservative rules, we couldn't reduce the system any more than we could increase it now. You could argue that that was a questionable approach, but we felt it was important to stabilize the system and not make arbitrary decisions in either direction. But one of the problems with proceeding in that way is that it assumes the DSM you inherited from Spitzer was fit for purpose. For example, it assumes that the disorders Spitzer's team included and the diagnostic threshold Spitzer's team set were themselves scientifically established. We did not assume that at all. We knew that everything that came before was arbitrary. Francis quickly corrects himself. We knew that most decisions that came before were arbitrary. I had been involved in DSM-3. I understood its limitations probably more than most people did, but the most important value at that time was to stabilize the system, not change it arbitrarily. So you're essentially saying you set out to stabilize the arbitrary decisions that were made during the construction of DSM-3. In other words, corrected Francis, it felt better to stabilize the existing arbitrary decisions than to create a whole assortment of new ones. And I thought that was a good place to bring our interview to a close. So now let me bring my presentation to a close with a final uh, paragraph. So I think what I've discussed with you today poses a serious challenge to those who embrace the conventional view that mental disorders are discrete patterns of biologically rooted pathological feeling and behavior identified by way of objective research processes. What an inspection of the DSM's construction rather reveals is that the separate disorders into which uh, DSM organized diverse behavioral and mental phenomena were largely the outcome of vote-based judgments settled by a small, culturally homogenous subset of mental health professionals who were socially positioned at a time to have their judgments ratified by the American Psychiatric association. While such judgments may indicate that a group of professionals sharing similar socio-cultural beliefs, biases, persuasions, and interests may see some things in the same way at a given point in time, they do not confirm that what they see is either objectively true, universal, or indeed stable in any verifiable sense. So let me bring my presentation to a close there. But before I just uh, go, I just want to say, uh, firstly, thank you very much for, for listening to the presentation. I, I'm looking forward to, to hearing your questions. Um, I've put up my, my Twitter 
uh, account here. I, I just started tweeting from my account about three months ago, and I, I'm starting to tweet. If you're interested in some of the things you've heard, I'm, I'm treating links to critical literature, I'm treating reflections on a our, our dominant model of mental health. So it's a very critical account, thinking uh, through the ways in which we're doing things uh, in a critical way. So if you're interested in any of the topics I've covered today, critical psychiatry, critical therapy, then please you know, feel free to, to follow me on Twitter. And you can, oh, we can I, I do answer um, people as well uh, on, on, on that site too. So uh, thank you so much for listening and I'll stop sharing my screen now if that's okay. James, that was absolutely wonderful. Um, I really appreciate it. I just have opened the chat function there. I'll give you a couple of seconds to, uh, maybe you need a glass of water um, and we'll go to chat then. Just to say, um, that was fabulous. It was everything that we'd hoped it would be uh, in Joe's preamble about how the presentation that you give uh, tends to completely change how people think. Um, I'm sure one or two people are now here today are just now gonna have questions, um, but it was an absolutely wonderful uh, presentation. And I can't recommend your book Cracked highly enough, and I'm really, really looking forward to your new book later on this uh, summer. So I'm going to open up the chat function here. I know of a couple of staff members who will help moderate it with me. So the first question has is, uh, I'll read out the comment, and then we, we'll go to the uh, question. So from Zoe, thank you, ILMI, for holding this event. And I'm delighted so many have attended today. A recovery-based approach has slowly taken off in Ireland, but I see it being hijacked or led by people who do not have the political analysis about mental health that has been discussed today. And our own mental health communities and movements are very saturated with HSE. That's James for, and Joe for reference. That's the health service executive, uh, mental health professionals who work in the medical model and not people with lived experience of harmful, harmful medicalized care. So Zoe's so question is, how can we create a space for a well thought out alternative in Ireland, which truly puts us who have experienced the harm of the medical model to the front. Um, if you have any thoughts on that, James. Yes, yes, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, it's, it's probably one of the most important questions you could ask actually at the moment. Um, uh, when it comes to the recovery narrative, I think that has been hijacked. So recovery is being defined also uh, in England as well, you know, defined as as something that is considered advantageous from the standpoint of politicians. So you're recovered if you're back to work, right? that, that's, that's recovery. Not whether or not you're, you've overcome your difficulties and you're living a more meaningful and rich life, that's not the measure of recovery. Recovery is your back contributing to the economy. So it's been hijacked by a sort of neoliberal um, preference for a particular way of being in the world. So while there's a lot to go, a lot to say about the recovery narrative, the way in which it's been hijacked is, is problematic. And we're seeing this happening in our own system, in the NHS, in the IAP psychotherapy system as well, and so on and so forth. Um, how, do we, how do we move forward? Um, well, there are some really interesting innovations. I mean, Joe mentioned Lucy Johnston earlier, who, uh, whose power threat meaning framework, I suspect, I mean, I, I don't know, Damien, if you've heard much about power threat meaning framework in, in Ireland. Yeah, I, I, I know that some of us were, did attend the 84 e event back in, in February, so there's, there's probably some people here today who have uh, seen Mary and Lucy's work around the, the, the power threat meaning framework, but if you want to expand it a little bit there, that'd be fantastic. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I would I would recommend that people go and look it up online. And um, I don't want to do it any any uh, injustice, uh, but it is rooting the causes of one's uh, distress and difficulties, not in biochemical imbalances or, or postulated uh, mental uh, brain dysfunctions, but in experiences, the things that have happened to you in your life, either in the past or in the present. So it, it invokes the the idea of trauma quite often. So traumatic, disadvantageous effects have palpable uh, emotional impact. Uh, and that impact sometimes registers in ways that makes life difficult. And so it's better to think about, as I think as Lucy puts it, not about patients with illnesses, but about people with problems. And it's, it's not about what's wrong with you, it's about what happened to you. So the different way of framing um, our experiences that doesn't invoke this medical narrative and everything that comes along with it. 
And I think there's a lot to be said for, for, for Lucy's work and, and Mary's work in, in this area. I very, advocate, I very much advocate it. But when, just to move away from that now to the, to the DSM, I think one of the things that I'm sympathetic uh, towards with respect to DSM is the, is the attempt to try and bring a kind of order to the chaos. So you've got multiplicity form of kinds of, of suffering, multiple forms of suffering, a lot of confusion as to what these different kinds of suffering are. And there was an honest attempt in the DSM project to try and kind of codify and classify different species of suffering. You know, as human beings, we, we are a classifying species, wherever you look, wherever society you go to, communities are trying to classify phenomena, whether it's the stars or it's a different species of animal or insect, etc., or plant, that's what we do. And they also have their own sort of nomenclatures when it comes to the internal world as well. And we, DSM is an attempt to kind of bring some order. And I, you know, I'm sympathetic to that. Uh, and there are some things to be said about that. The problem with DSM, of course, is that it doesn't stop with classifying different species of suffering. It then takes the next step of pathologizing all of this stuff, right? So it all now becomes, it doesn't become a natural and normal reaction to difficult events. Suffering isn't a protest against inhospitable environmental conditions that need to be changed. It isn't actually a call to change, it becomes an index of dysfunction. So it pronounces on the meaning of the suffering and strips from it its purposeful uh, uh, nature. And that's the, 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 the part of the DSM project I'm, I'm, I'm very critical of. Many thanks, James. Uh, there's a specific question here I know you'll want to address because uh, I, I've, I've seen talks where you've, you've said, yourself and others have said, where you have someone who queries around their own medicalization and, and uh, where they've been uh, on prescription uh, and says, I'm not sure if I should go back on it, but if, if I stop taking it. I know there's a specific advice you'd always give to people who are questioning when they're on medication at the moment, there, there's a structured way to think around that and act on it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the first thing I would say about, about um, this is that it has to be a, a conversation you have with your, your prescriber. And I would never, ever advocate somebody stopping their meds on their own. I mean, I think, you know, withdrawal, we know that these drugs elicit withdrawal effects. And if you withdraw too quickly, these effects can be, can be really, really damaging um, and protracted. So if you do have thoughts about relationship your relationship to the medication you're taking that's absolutely fine and natural to wonder about the effects the drugs are having on you but these are conversations you need to be having with a prescriber and if you decide that prescribing with your physician is the right thing to do and hopefully you'll have a sympathetic prescriber it, it, the right thing then you have to taper very slowly and there's a lot of information online as to how that can be best facilitated but i think at all costs one must avoid trying to stop these drugs and trying to do it quickly uh, because the, the, the effects of that can be very, very harmful. Thanks for clarifying that. We'd one just coming in privately there, uh, feeling that so, some of your conversation was around what was called peripheral diagnoses. Um, but the question that this person has, what about the core diagnosis from DSM, such as bipolar and schizophrenia? Are these uh, diagnoses on a, a sound clinical, clinical footing? Well, I think what I just presented to you um, and the process that I um, illuminated with respect to how these diagnoses were contrived applies to all of the diagnoses in the DSM, bar the, the few organic disorders like uh, Huntington's disease and epilepsy and some, some rare forms of dementia where there are biomarkers. But everything else was really a process of people sitting down in a room and trying to trying to decide between them, where do we draw the threshold um, between normality and abnormality? And what are the core characteristics of this so-called syndrome or cluster of experiences that we've identified happening in, in different places? So, um, you know, I, 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 I therefore, given how the process looks personally, do not believe it is the correct approach to think of these diagnoses as, as indicative of uh, identified things within the brain that have led to your, your problems. They're social categories that try to capture experience and, and they're hugely imperfect insofar as they, they miss so much nuance. 
and also medicalize and pathologize so many experiences that could be understood in non-medicalized, pathologizing, pathologizing ways. Just, I'm going to be very cheeky and ask a question. I know it, you cover it extensively in your work. Um, you obviously didn't have time today. You might explain for people the, the, the diagnostic threshold for DSM, what that means and how diagnoses are made. Um, if you could do that very briefly, if it's possible. Yeah, so uh, well, let's take depression. So um, th there are, that was decided there are nine symptoms for depression. In order to classify as having depression, they decided that you'd have to have five of these symptoms for two weeks or longer, okay? There was a really, a really interesting psychiatrist called Daniel Carlack who asked Robert Spitzer, well, why did you decide on five symptoms for two weeks or longer? Why didn't you decide on three symptoms for five weeks or seven symptoms for one week, et cetera, and so forth? And his answer, he, he rather cheekily smiled and said, well, four symptoms sounded like too few and six sounded like too many. And what he was trying to allude to there, again, the same process I've described took place with respect to setting symptom thresholds. They had to agree, where are we gonna put it? Well, let's put it at five rather than four. But these, these decisions have huge impact, societal impact. And I don't think the team at the time realized the extent to which DSM was gonna change the world certainly the world of mental health. This is by far the most influential book in the history of mental health. It's not, nothing can compare to it. And when they were writing it, I don't think they realized the impact their decision-making would have. It was, a, it was a surprise to Spitzer that the DSM did well. I think at times during the process, they were, they were thinking, you know, what are we doing? Is anyone going to pay any attention to our work? Well, we did pay attention to their work and their work has fundamentally reconfigured how we understand and manage distress. And I think this is why people are so surprised when they hear about the arbitrary nature of the construction of the manual, um, because we forget that, we forget that. And there is a huge issue in relation to how grief was categorized as a disorder as well. Yeah, well, that, well, that was uh, to do with something called the grief exclusion. So if you had suffered loss, it used to be the case for DSM-3 and DSM-4 that you didn't qualify for the depression of diagnosis, right? So let's say you lost a loved one four weeks early and you go to the doctor and you've got depressive symptoms. It would be the case that the doctor would say, well, well, you're in grief, so therefore we won't be diagnosed with depression because your experience can account for why you feel as you do. But when it came to the creation of DSM-5, which was published in 2013, they decided to remove that grief exclusion, which effectively meant if you have lost someone you love, if you go to your doc week, doctor two weeks after that and report your distress, you could effectively be diagnosed with depression. Uh, which was not the case before, which in a sense, what, what happened there is that, again, you're expanding the definition of illness further and further to encompass yet more and more domains of natural and normal human experience. And in this instance, grieving someone you love, you've lost. Okay. And this is the major criticism of DSM. It's just medicalized more and more of what goes on within us, almost to the extent that any difficult emotion doesn't escape doesn't escape the net, so to speak. And um, we've quite a few questions here. I'd be just take maybe two or three for more. Jackie, uh, has James any ideas on how to challenge both families and medics who latch onto labels as a convenient way to medicalize people experiencing mental health crisis? The whole area of anxiety is gaining huge traction, especially for younger people in Ireland. It's a, it's a very difficult question to answer because it, it really does depend on the, on the physician you're speaking to and how open-minded they are with respect to critical ideas and critical ways of thinking. I would hope that most clinicians would be open to listening to a patient's concerns and fears uh, regarding the narrative being used and be open to the patient or the person, I would prefer to call to call them, um, you know, are articulating a desire for another way of thinking about their condition and also be open to hearing about resources that they themselves may not know much about. 
you know, referring to the to the mental health professional, referring them to documents or resources that could could support their position. Um, but it's a tricky it's a tricky question to answer because I don't think there's a general rule here with respect to how how to manage these difficult circumstances. And I do hear again and again people who get trapped in the system and can't get out and are dealing with people who are very unsympathetic to non-medical ways of framing the problem. Very unsympathetic to the idea that their, that their suffering may not be chronic, right? Maybe situational, maybe a response to really bad stuff that, have, that has happened uh, uh, and may not indicate a long-term chronic mental disorder that requires uh, treatment, terminal treatment. So. Um, and I, see, I hear about this a lot, and it's very difficult for such people. So I think for those people, it's about recruiting resources in the community. Oftentimes, other organisations that can speak on your heart, on your behalf, and that sometimes can be helpful. James, I'm just very conscious that you're probably getting close to exhaustion here. So I'm, I have two questions I'm going to take. And apologies to anyone who we haven't had a chance to come to. Um, and maybe there's there's food for thought for ILMI about future events in relation to this issue. And I'll, I'll mention that very briefly in the wrap up. Uh, Grace, uh, she, James, she wanted to know, when you studied therapy, was the history of the DSM and critiques of psychiatry as a whole included in sociology stu uh, studies? Uh, here, critiques of the therapy industry and biomedical approach are included. However, in applied psychology, and the therapy course that I'm familiar with, that do not include this. Unknowingly, many professionals are unable to see that suffering does not have to be pathologized and consciously uh, or unconsciously, this will be passed on to those that they are helping, that there is something inherently disordered about them. Also, hope one day that what we call mental health is discussing a different view will be included, just as rightly or wrongly, uh, different views uh, were heard surrounding the base, which is abortion. Uh, of course, this is not a debatable issue, and one day people look back on the harm that psychiatry has caused us. So it, that question initially about you know, when you're studying, are those critiques of uh, DSM and psychiatry avail widely available? Or were you trailblazing back when you, when you published uh, Cracked? Uh, they weren't available. Uh, um, and I think, I, think, I think that's changed. I mean, I was training uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, back then, there was a huge amount of deference to the medical model. You could find literature yourself, of course, you could, you could read up. Also, I was learning a bit of humanistic psychotherapy and in, implicit within humanistic psychotherapy is a critique of the medical model. So it was embedded within some of the training, but there was still within the training, broadly speaking, a deference to the medical model. So you didn't push against it too hard. I still think there is there's a huge deficit in critical thinking within certainly psychiatric training still today. Uh, which is which is regrettable. I think we're seeing a shift in psychology. I think there's a lot of critical thought in the psychological profession. When you think of uh, the previous president of the British Psychological Society was, was Professor Peter Kinderman from University of Liverpool, you know, who's written a number of very, very, very good books on, on critical psychiatry. And he was at the helm of the British Psychological Society. The British Psychological Society spoke out against DSM-5, started a petition to, to stop its publication right, for a whole host of legitimate reasons. Um, so there, you know, there is a, a robust and growing critical voice within mental health, certainly more so than there was 20 years ago. And that is really encouraging to see. I still don't think trainings have caught up uh, quite. Uh, and that's, that hopefully will, will, will change. And in particular, psychiatry trainings. I think there's a big problem there with the curricula. It's still very, very heavily focused on the biomedical model, on diagnosis and medication being at the root of what psychiatry does. Many thanks, James. I'm going to uh, just knock the chat off just for a few seconds, um, and I'm going to bring Joe back because I know there's a whole series of events. You flagged some of them um, in, in your start of your input, but I just wanted to bring Joe back to uh, flag some events that are coming up and for people to be made aware of additional work that uh, Drop the Disorder are doing and a disorder for everyone. Um, and within that, uh, for anyone that's attended today, we will send out links to the Disorder for Everyone website. <laughs> Um, and we will also uh, send out the Twitter handles uh, for people to, to track as well. Um, I'm just going to take spotlight from James there and if I can find uh, Joe and I'll spotlight Joe and get her back in. There you go, Joe. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Okay, do you want to come back in, Joe? Oh, you're muted at the moment. One second. Hiya. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to just um, flag up a few a few things. If anybody um, wants to find out a little bit more about AD4E, we've got a website that's a disorder for everyone.com and a YouTube channel, which you'll find some really good talks from our previous events, including um, talks from James and lots and lots of other people. Um, so that's worth checking out. And um, then we've got an upcoming event in July, which um, James is going to be presenting on his new book, Sedated, which is out, as you've already mentioned, on the 3rd of June. So that's exciting. Um, we've got an, uh, a, also an, a repeat of last year's festival, obviously with different people involved, um, on the 17th of September. Um, and then we've got uh, another one of our poetry nights, which is on the 16th of April, I think. And we're also incorporating a little bit of music in, into that night. Um, yeah, we've been hosting poetry nights since last May, and it's basically a space where people can share poems that challenge the whole culture of um, diagnosis and disorder and generally kind of spend a bit of time together. Um, it's a nice space. And so, yeah, please come along. And uh, yeah, poetry is a big part of, of what we do at AD4E. We've always had poetry incorporated into all of the events. And we, we published a book called We Are the Change Makers, which um, contains lots of, lots of people's poetry. And that's worth checking out if you like that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, with that in mind, I think we're going to, I think Damien, you're going to play a, a poem of, of mine that's been made into a film by a really talented guy called um, Ian Smith. Um, the poem's inspired by Eleanor Longdon, who did a TED talk some years back now called The Voices in My Head. One of the things she says is a, is a phrase that James mentioned earlier. Um, she says that the main question in psychiatry and mental health shouldn't be what's wrong, it should be what happened. And my poem's called I'm With Her. So thanks in advance for watching. And I'm with her, like not on the fence, because surely our mental health is linked to experience, so often a direct consequence of trauma, of oppression. You see, we're fooled into thinking that it's about biology, physiology, and intrinsic to identity. They tell us that it's in our genes instead of being in the scenes of what happened to us that play out on repeat sometimes, on repeat sometimes, on repeat sometimes. Some of our great grandmothers were incarcerated, locked away for years and years, left to decay, sometimes shackled in metal vices while slices of their brains were cut out to exercise the threat. And yeah, this meant that sometimes they would forget the horrors but it also meant that sometimes they would forget their names. I guess it won't come as a big surprise that many of our grandmothers were tranquilized, pretty much sedated, and this equated to a, a kind of half-life, often for their entire life. And when this didn't quite sort them out, make them sane, well, they may have well been strapped down whilst electricity was shot into their brain. Lots of our mothers were flooded with old school antidepressants and mass unnecessary womb extractions and reactions to instant hormones, which for some meant a detour around that midlife rite of passage that may have brought them home. And as for us, well, we are labeled and medicated, disorders allocated, often accumulated, because there's no shortage of diagnostic criteria.
to explain any deliria or otherwise. There's a disorder for everyone. They're in the book, the DSM-5. That's the place from where they all derive, hundreds of them, all squashed in, all planned. So our disorder has to fit and we need the pills to cure it, to cure us, be our defense. Chemical compounds of modern science that conveniently turn off or tone down our emotions, our feelings. Again, if you don't medicate it, it exasperates it, and eventually it's like a tsunami. If they look like a dead animal, that's depression. If your kid has it, get those antidepressants. Because now, even the good ones are having a try. You know, the likes of Ruby Wax and good old Stephen Fry, sadly, still perpetuating all the toxic lies and generally doing a great job of using celebrity status to pathologize. There are two things you have to remember. One is that your condition is serious, very serious, and indeed it can be life-threateningly serious. So we all get to believing that it is about us. So part of me, the heart of me that isn't going away, it's here to stay, needs to be chemically explained. You know, Eleanor London, she wasn't ever asked about what had happened to her or any of her past. They just said she had an illness, a kind of broken brain, and that this explained the voices and the corresponding pain. So diagnosed with schizophrenia and written off as a hopeless case. And yeah, you may be thinking this is an absolute disgrace, but it isn't an exception. It happens every day and it's time to change the script now and find another way. We don't have to live our lives forever defined by the damaging things that have happened to us. We are unique, we are irreplaceable. What lies within us can never be truly colonized, contorted or taken away. The light never goes out. So the next poetry night, Joe, just to confirm for everybody. 16th of April, I think. Okay, and we'll, we'll send out uh, links to the AD4E website where people can sign up through Eventbrite, is that correct, for that, any of the future right. events? And, and like, like you've said, I don't think you've done your website justice, and particularly the YouTube channel. There's a whole host of absolutely spectacular resources there that are available to anybody who has participated today and wants to learn more. So I'd really like to thank yourself and James for joining us today. Uh, just before we finish up. Oops, we've moved into another video. I'll just close that out, excuse me. Um, what I wanted to do in uh, wrapping up today is to thank obviously yourself and James for giving your time uh, but also to thank everyone who showed up. Uh, I've just to note that we did record uh, the, the um, input by James, which we will put on our YouTube channel at a later stage and obviously link to the AD4E um, YouTube channel as well. Uh, so that anyone who couldn't participate today will be able to, to find out uh, how things went on and to learn from James's input. Um, I'd like to thank the staff for giving the support today. Just to finish up, I know there's some queries about what the next steps were. To uh, clarify for anyone, this is the first step for ILMI as a disabled persons organization, exploring the social model of disability and how it impacts on people who have and had experience of emotional distress and to challenge the medical model of disability, including the diagnostic uh, medical model that James has, I think, very uh, keenly put to, to the sword today. So it's not the end point, it's only the beginning. And we're hoping that from today, that people who have got the lived experience 
um, of experiencing emotional distress and interacting with the psychiatric system uh, will be interested in the work that we do to work on a cross impairment basis. It's very worth noting that there are two significant things happening at the moment in Ireland. Ireland, uh, the state is uh, compiling its first report to the UN uh, CRPD, the Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities, um, and that will be submitted this summer. So there is huge opportunity for disabled people to have their voices heard. Um, and we've just uh, in the process of finalizing the consultation process with disabled people via Zoom, the length and breadth of the country, including people who've experienced emotional distress to ensure um, that the UN are made aware of the practices that still exist in Ireland, including the deprivation of people's liberty based on diagnosis. So it's really important that people get involved in those uh, processes. And then to also, um, it's a very short timeline, but just notified this month that the Mental Health Act uh, 2001 is being reviewed by the Department of Health in Ireland. Um, and there's a call for submissions and we'll circulate that out in the information to anyone who's participated today. Just very worryingly, the process of the timeline for that is very, very short. That submissions must be in by the end of March. But just to reassure anyone who has participated today and uh, that this is not the end, but merely the start for ILMI. And hopefully the people who are passionate about this um, that they would um, uh, get involved in any way, shape or form in our work. Um, and final thing just been noted uh, by one of my colleagues is that for anyone who has attended today hasn't already signed up to our e-bulletin, uh, that's the way that we communicate any of the Zooms and the discussion spaces, which are very participatory, uh, please do so just by email and info at ilmi.ie and because we'd encourage as much participation as possible. Um, I've been asked by one of our colleagues, I know we, we had at the past said that if people had turned their cameras off, but it's often nice to get a sense of who participated today, if people are willing to do that by turning their cameras on. Uh, and that way we could take a nice big screenshot to kind of capture that this was a very important moment um, for us as a DPO. So I don't know if people are willing to do that, if they'd like to put their cameras on and maybe uh, some of the people who are hosting today could ask for people to put their cameras on. I don't know, uh, the two Jameses from ILMI or Shelley or Fiona, if you can manage that. Yeah, everyone's got their, everyone's looking fantastic. Um, and whoever's taking, who's taking the screenshot, can they just count down to give everyone a little heads up so that my hair is in the right way. Uh, I think it's Fiona's doing the countdown for that one. Fiona, are you doing the countdown? Fiona, well done. Yes. Just give me a sec, okay? Okay. Can you hear me? We yeah, can. yeah, we can hear you, yeah, yeah. Okay, I just had to grab the first now. I'd say one, two, three, and on three, say cheese, okay? <laughs> Ready? One, two, three, cheese. Okay, now let's do the second screen. Okay. And again, just go with me. Everyone has great smiles on them. Love the teddy bear. <laughs> One, two, three, cheese. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> There's another, there's another screen, Fiona. We want, we want to make sure we get everyone. Another one. Jeez. Yeah. Just two, just two the, the best one, the most beautiful people on, on screen three. So don't, don't start that now. Don't start that. <laughs> I have a bigger screen, so I have only two screens. Okay, that's oh, great. Okay. So we, we've, again, I just want to extend my genuine and sincere thanks to Joe and James. Um, when we reached out to Joe um, in a very short period of time, she got back and was more than keen to share the expertise of a disorder for everyone with ILMI. Um, and the values that AD4E have are very much consistent with the values of ILMI. And it was such a pleasure to be able to work with them. And maybe this is just the start of a working relationship. But I would, when we send the, the information out to people later on today, I would encourage people to check out their website and to sign up for future events that they have. And we'll take on any comments that people come back from today and see how ILMI as a cross impairment DPO continue to create uh, spaces that meet the needs of all disabled people, including people who, who have and do experience emotional distress. Uh, to inform the work that we do. And I, I really hope that this is just the start 
um, of a very exciting journey for us as a national DPO. So I want to thank everyone for their participation today um, and we hope to be in touch with you all soon. Thank you.